The scripture reading today is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. <clears throat> On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her hus household were baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The word of the Lord. Take a moment now for silent reflection. So the last time I was here in March, I talked a little bit about one of the myths that we tell ourselves as humans. One of those myths is that we care more about the truth than we care about belonging. But the truth is we've always cared more about belonging than we care about the truth. I talked back in March about how I, as a pastoral counselor, have clients come to me who courageously are ready to confront their perpetrator, a member of their family. And they say to me, I know my family is going to back me up in this because they are aware of the abuse that took place. And I have to be the one to tell them that likely the family is not going to back them up because people, in fact, would rather belong to that dysfunctional family system than they would to courageously speak the truth. And I wish I were wrong most of the time, but I'm not. I'm usually right. Because the truth is, we humans care more about belonging than we do about the truth. But there's another myth that we tell ourselves, and that myth is that more than anything else, we want to be free. That freedom matters to us more than anything else. It's on the license plates in New Hampshire, live free or die. And we all remember that iconic phrase from the movie Braveheart. They may take away our lives, but they will never take away our freedom. They don't have to take away our freedom because it's a myth that we want to be free. We give away our freedom. Did you know there are only three moral standards for our species? Only three through the history of time. All of us hold to one of three basic moral foundations or standards. The first and oldest moral standard is that there is no greater good than to protect the integrity of the tribe. That there's no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe. This is the oldest of the three moral standards because we as a species never took off until we move from the level of blood kin to the level of tribe. That's when civilizations developed. That's when possibilities and language began to develop, when we moved from being blood kin in our orientation to being tribal in our orientation. And in so doing, we decided there's no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe, which means we were more than willing to give away our freedom to the leaders of the tribe for the integrity of the tribe. It is still the primary moral standard of much of the continent of Africa and other developing nations. The first and oldest moral standard that there's no greater good than protecting the integrity of the tribe. There's a second moral standard. This one has no geographical boundaries. The second moral standard is that there's no greater moral good than to obey the teachings 
of the gods. And this is the moral standard of all forms of fundamentalism, wherever you find it in the world, particularly among the fundamentalist forms of the desert religions. There are three desert religions, Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. They all began in the desert, therefore they all began as religions of scarcity. There's not many resources to go around in the desert, and so I've got to take care of me and mine. There were those who were in and those who were out, those who were good and those who were bad. Now you contrast that with, let's say, Native American religions or Pacific Islander religions, and you see a massive difference because the others are religions of abundance because they developed in places of abundance. But the desert religions began as religions of scarcity. And therefore, you had to appease an angry God. Now, fortunately, in their more generous forms, all three are no longer religions of scarcity, but in their fundamentalist forms, all three remain religions of scarcity. In the Middle East, that's Islam. In the United States, it's fundamentalist and evangelical Christianity. And there's no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods, even to force upon the rest of a culture the teachings of those gods, which is what we see happening politically in the United States today. But there is a third moral standard. It's actually the smallest of the three, followed by the fewest people of the three which is hard for us to understand because it's the moral standard of secular America. And what is this third moral standard? That there's no greater moral good than to protect the freedom of the individual. This is, in fact, the profound secular moral standard on which our entire nation is established. It's quite clearly the moral standard on the East Coast and on the West Coast. It's the moral standard in Western Europe, in Scandinavia, in Australia, New Zealand. It is, in fact, the moral standard under which most of us grew up, that there's no greater moral good than to protect the freedom of the individual. And where does that moral standard come from? Ultimately, Christianity. Because every one of those nations holding to that moral standard began as Christian nations. It goes back to the teachings of Jesus in the 8th chapter of John when Jesus says, I will make you free, and if I make you free, you will be free indeed. And as Paul took the gospel into Europe, to Galatia, what's now Turkey, into Greece, what then was the city of Philippi, the city of Thessalonica, off the Aegean Sea. When Paul took the message of the gospel there, more than anything else, he wanted it to be a message of freedom. That's why he became so angry when the Galatian Christians who were Jews coming from the Roman Empire came with the rules and regulations of Judaism with them and told the new Celtic Christians from northern Galatia that they had to be followers of the Jewish law as well as followers of the teachings of Jesus. That's why Paul wrote his letter to the church at Galatia to say that is not the case because he knew northern Galatia, he knew what is now modern-day Greece, were peopled by Celtic people. The Celtic people came from Central Europe, moved to Western Europe, permeated all of continental Europe and the British Isles, but the Romans saw them as barbarians and drove them out of continental Europe. So the only place their culture survived with great strength was the British Isles. But interestingly, what marked these people more than anything else was their love of freedom. And it was, in fact, that form of Christianity, Celtic Christianity, which took root here in the United States, where the major focus was freedom. No wonder this perspective appealed to the woman named Lydia. She was not a conventional woman of the age. She worked outside the home. She was an entrepreneur. She manufactured and sold goods, purple dye, purple cloth, to the higher end of the financial world. She became quite wealthy, had a large home, and then also being un unconventional, she freely chose a new religion, a religion focused on the person of Jesus, a religion focused on freedom. 
And not only did she become a part of that religion, she encouraged her household to do so, and then she bankrolled the work of Paul and the other three apostles who were with him. In fact, she and three other women bankrolled pretty much all of the work he did throughout what is now modern-day Greece. She understood that there is nothing more important than living authentically, that the call toward authenticity is sacred and holy and for the greater good. Do you know we are all spiritual beings? Every single human being is spiritual. It's just that our spirituality does not get as much attention as the other parts of our lives. What gets most attention is our ego. Because our ego has just two desires, power and safety. The ego reigns in most all of our lives because we all want power and we all want safety. But as we grow and mature, we're often able to break beneath the level of ego to the level of soul. Occasionally, the soul will bubble up through the bedrock harshness of our egos, the ego that demands power, that demands safety. The soul bubbles up through it, and the soul is not interested in power and safety. The soul is interested in the ride. The soul is interested in the journey. And so we create opportunities for the soul to slip forth through the bedrock harshness of things. And there are, in fact, six stages of spiritual development. The first three do not get beyond the stage of the ego. The first two are the magical stages of spirituality we have in childhood. Initially, it's mom and dad who were all powerful, all controlling. And once we realize they're not, we move to stage two where it's superheroes who are all powerful and all controlling. But then we come into the first adulthood our adolescence, our 20s, 30s, when the vast majority of us move to stage three of spiritual development, which is in fact traditional religion. We accept whatever religion has been handed to us, but that religion at this stage is almost always a religion of rules and regulations. It is a religion based usually in the desert religions and their very angry God who kept resources to himself and did not spread resources to everyone, to a God who demanded fealty, to a God who said, you must obey my rules and regulations or I will send you to hell, to a religion focused on blood sacrifice. This is, in fact, traditional fundamentalism, traditional fundamentalist Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. But we come to the point in life where that's no longer working for us. We get to the point when we're not looking for rules and regulations and we have a difficult time accepting the notion of a God who basically hates us as we are and demands that we change tremendously before he might reluctantly allow us into his very restrictive heaven because we become parents and we know we would never treat our own children that way. That we love our children no matter what even though they are often not real lovable. And we begin to question and doubt this third type of spirituality, this third stage where we have been taught that an angry God demands that we follow that God before we will be allowed reluctantly by that God into heaven and we come into stage four of spiritual development which is in fact hell. That's right. Stage four of our spiritual development is hell. At least that's how Dante defined it. Because at the beginning of the Divine Comedy, he said, in the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. This is the fourth stage of spiritual development. It's what Shakespeare has Macbeth saying. Life is but a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This is the delightful part of stage four of our spiritual development. We begin to question absolutely everything. It's what John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. It's what Joseph Campbell in the hero's journey calls the road of trials that leads straight into the deep, dark, black, cave where the true way is wholly lost. 
It is, in fact, a period of great spiritual disillusionment and disenchantment. It is, in fact, learning that doubting everything is the beginning of wisdom. That's right. Doubting everything is the beginning of wisdom. This is the stage at which we discover the truth will set you free, but it is guaranteed to make you miserable first. So my son and I have the great privilege of being what's called speaker's ambassadors for TED. And so just last month, we were in Vancouver at their major event where both Jonathan and I were working with several different speakers, getting them ready for their TED talk, which is a delightful experience. But one of the speakers with whom I was working came to me and said, you know, they had all of us watch a couple of your TED talks. And one of the TED talks they had us watch in preparation for our own was the TED talk you did with your son. And the speaker said, and you are a pastor, correct? I said, yes. And he said, well then, I kind of want to quote one of your lines word for word from that talk you did with your son. You said in that talk, I believe in God most days, except for Tuesdays and Thursdays, and any day I'm on the New Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> he said, how could you as a pastor say that? I said, have you ever driven on the New Jersey Turnpike? <laughs> I said, oh my, how could I not say that? Have you seen what's happening in Ukraine? Do you know what's happening to democracy all over the Western world? Do you see what's happening in our nation to trans kids? How could you not question, is anybody in charge of all this? How could you not question the very existence of God. This is stage four of spiritual development, and it's terrifying. It's the point at which you question absolutely everything, and for a lot of people, it's too much, far too much. And so what do they do? One of two things. They either rush back to stage three, where they go back to the religion in which they were raised, and now those people are very happy to have them back. They have them give testimonies about how they wandered away from God, but now they've returned to God as backsliders made good. And what, of course, we don't realize is that that is, in fact, the failure of nerve. It was the failure of their own courage that took them back to stage three. That's what some people do. But the majority of people in today's America... Just ignore stage four. In fact, they ignore their soul. They allow their ego to call all the shots. They no longer exercise their spiritual muscles. And they become truncated in their spiritual development. Their souls remain immature, stuck in stage four. We all know many friends who were stuck there. The effort doesn't seem to be worth it. But it is worth it. Because if you make it through stage four, you come into stage five of spiritual development where ironically, most of the time, you end up returning to the religion in which you were raised in just a very different way. No longer is it a religion of rules and regulations, but now it's a religion focused on love. It's a religion that is broad and deep. It's a big tent. It's this church. A church of people in stages four and five, it's the church I lead in Boulder County, Colorado. A church filled with people who are questioning and wondering and trying to allow their soul to slip forth. And those who are struggling and yet return to a very clear focus on the person of Jesus. That is the focal point of this church. That is the focal point of my faith. It is the person of Jesus. But you welcome in others from other backgrounds. You encourage them to join you as we search for meaning together, as long as they understand that we are, in fact, a Christian church. Only it's not a stage three spirituality. It's not rules and regulations. It is, in fact, a more mystical faith. It is a mi more mysterious faith. It's not a faith interested in giving you answers. It's a faith interested in asking the right questions. 
When we get to stage five, we find we have fewer friends but deeper friendships. We no longer look outside ourselves for our sense of purpose, but we look deep inside our own soul. And in this stage, we realize when we have been called, we must answer that call, often onto the hero's journey. Now, there is a stage six, but my experience is not many folks get there. Pretty much can guarantee you I'm not going to get there. Who gets to stage six? You know, Mother Teresa, you know, Gandhi, or possibly one of my favorites from the 1950s, the great Secretary General of the United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, who wrote shortly before his untimely death, he had a premonition about his coming death, and he wrote these words, for all that has been thanks, for all that shall be yes. He wrote, night is drawing nigh for all that has been thanks, for all that shall be yes. Okay, when you get to the point you can say that, now maybe you're at stage six of spiritual development. Most of us end up staying in stage five of spiritual development. And of course, Jesus shows us how to get from three to six. He always showed how to get from three to six. It's the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. The disciples are stuck in stage three of spiritual development. They want Jesus to be the new political king of Israel. They want him to defeat all of their enemies, bring independence back to their people, and give them power and free food. They're working from the level of ego. And Jesus says to them, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And then he says he's coming back, but he says it in a way that's so confusing they don't understand a thing at all. He says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. When I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again that where I am you may be also, and you know the way where I'm going. Huh? They have no idea what he's talking about. He's talking about leaving and coming back in the form of the Holy Spirit, not exactly a well-understood concept. But only one of the disciples has the guts to admit it because he's the only one initially willing to go into stage four of disillusionment. It's Thomas, and he says, we don't know what you're talking about. How would we know the way? And Jesus gives him the gold. I am the way, the truth, the life. You want to know what's true? Look at me. You want to know what it means to be fully, truly free? Look at me. Live like I live. Do what I do. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then Jesus does it again, this time without words. It's the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John. He's been taken captive by the Jewish authorities. They have decided he's deserving of death, and he's taken before the Roman governor, Pilate. Pilate, not a happy man. He thought that maybe his political patronage would give him a really, really neat ambassadorship in one of those cool nations, but no, he ends up in Palestine, where all the Jewish people of Israel can't get along with each other, and now they've brought to him yet one more Messiah claiming to be the Messiah, and it's the last thing he wants to deal with. And he says to the Jewish leaders, oh, deal with this guy yourself. And they say, oh, but this is a really bad one. He needs to be executed. And you, as Romans, have not given us the power to do that. And so he says, fine, bring him into my palace. That's exactly what happens. And my scripture is gone. I found it. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Was that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? You can see Pilate Greek. I've got a live one this time. Oh, I ask a simple yes or no question. Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Oh, so you are a king then. 
Said Pilate, Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me and Pilate, exasperated not just by Jesus, but by every one of these people, says, What is the truth? And Jesus just stands there. And stands there. And silently stands there. And Pilate becomes so uncomfortable, he leaves the room and goes to talk to other people, while all those who remain see Jesus just standing there. The truth in the flesh. And every one of them were taken back to that moment just a few weeks earlier when Jesus had once again been before a hostile crowd. It was his last public press conference, the last time he would ever meet with the crowds at large, and they were all trying to trap him, to send him to his death. And the final public question he was ever asked was a very simple one. Which of the laws is the greatest? There were 613 of them. Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. His last public answer to his last public question. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as you love your own self. There was no, no, no question about his answer. It was exactly what they expected. They began every one of their religious services quoting those two laws. The problem is what Jesus said next. Because what Jesus said next was, on this are all the law and the prophets based. Now they'd spent their entire lives studying the 613 laws of the Hebrew scriptures. That wasn't enough for them. They'd written more. They had turned all of religion into rules and regulations, which if you follow them, will cause a very reluctant God to allow you into heaven. And Jesus comes along and says, no! No! It's just three things. Loving God, loving neighbor, and the hardest of all, loving your own self. Allowing your soul to win over your ego, seeking power and safety. Loving yourself. And Matthew tells us there was dead silence. Dead silence. And Jesus just stood there. And stood there. And stood there. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The truth was in the person of Jesus. The truth that sets you free is incredibly simple. Loving God, loving neighbor, and loving self. Incredibly simple, but not easy. The words of Mary Oliver, sweet Jesus talking his melancholy madness, stood up in the boat and the sea lay down, silky and sorry. So everybody lived that night, but you know how it is when something different crosses the threshold. The uncles mutter together, the women walk away, the young brother begins to sharpen his knife. Nobody knows what the soul is. It comes and goes like the wind over the water, sometimes for days you don't think of it. Maybe after the storm, after the multitude was fed, one or two of the disciples felt the soul slip forth like a tremor of pure sunlight before exhaustion that wants to follow everything, swallow everything. Forgetting how the wind tore at the sails before he rose and spoke to it. Tender, luminous, demanding. As he always was, a thousand times more frightening than the killer sea. Forgetting how terrified they were before he rose and spoke to the wind and settled it. Tender, luminous, demanding. 
as he always was, as he always is. It is the simplest message on earth to love God, love neighbor, and love self. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. God, thank you for showing us how. How to go through stages of disenchantment until our faith is re-enchanted. To go through periods of disillusionment, to stay through the dark night of the soul, to be willing to go into the place called lost because lost is a place to thank you for giving us the courage to move beneath the level of ego to the level of soul and now teach us, God, to love you. Teach us to love our neighbors, particularly the ones that don't look like us. And God, we know we won't be able to do the first two if we can't do the third. The hardest work of all. Teach us to love ourselves. For this is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen.